Welcome to the United Leukodystrophy Presents 4-H with Dr. Bernard from Montreal Children's Hospital. Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and um, uh, and so uh, most of you, I think, know me. I don't know who's there and not there, but I know most of you uh, know me. Um, I'm a pediatric neurologist and a, a research scientist at the McGill University Health Center Research Institute and uh, an associate professor at McGill. And I will talk to you about a research update of uh, polyarty related leukodystrophy or 4 H leukodystrophy. So here are my disclosures. Uh, none of them have anything to do with what I'm going to present today. So um, some of you probably have seen this slide before, but I thought it would be good to just make every, make sure everybody's on the same page to start and understand the later slides of the stock. So we'll start we'll start with some basic genetic no notion. So in our cell in our body, we have millions of millions of cells. In each cell, there's a nucleus. In the nucleus, we have the chromosomes. I hope you see my arrow. And um, every, uh, so we, we receive one chromosome from our father and one from our mother. And if you unroll them for a very long time and then you use specific techniques, you can actually read the different letters. Every three letters code for what we call an amino acid, which is a very small part of a protein. So in order to produce the proteins, we have to first um, have the DNA transcribed into RNA, which is the intermediate between the RNA and the protein, and then the translation from the RNA to the protein. So if you look at the gene uh, in its simplest form, you have um, the exon, which are the the, the genetic material coding for the RNA and the protein. And then you have the exon, the entron. And you also have a, a region here called the exon entron boundary. So the exon, the exon entron uh, boundaries are important because it, it, um, it tells the machinery that do the transcription where to cut each exon to do the RNA, which will then be transcribed, translated into a protein. And so protein formation is important uh, for myelin development, but also for myelin maintenance. So there is different way uh, genetic diseases can be inherited. Uh, in, in the case of 4-H leukodystrophy, it's an autosomal recessive disease. So I said earlier that you have one copy of this gene from one of your parents. So if you have a normal copy, on one of your gene and you have a disease copy one with a variant on the other on the other uh, gene in case of in the case of a recessive disease you're healthy but then our, each time you have it if you're in uh, in um, in a couple with someone who have is this in the same case has a, a mutation on one of his gene and, an, and a normal copy on the other gene this person is also healthy but every time they have a child they have one chance, 25% uh, chance of having an affected child. They have 25% uh, of having a child that not that's not affected, and that is not a carrier. And then you have one in uh, one in two chance of having a child that is a carrier, just like mom or dad. So we're going to do a little bit of review on of myelin and leukodystrophy. Uh, so there, um, so there's a few definitions I wanted to review with you. The first is leukoencephalopathy, uh, which is any disease of the brain white matter. Uh, leukodystrophy is a disease of the brain, the brain white matter, but it's genetic in origin, and we think that the the main abnormality is associated to uh, the myelin being unhealthy or not or insufficient myelin. In the case of genetically, genetically determined leukoencephalopathy, these diseases um, are thought to be caused by, dis by disorders affecting other uh, cells of the brain, uh, such as vascular uh, disease, systemic disease, uh, neuronal disease, that also lead to white matter abnormality, but it doesn't seem to be the primary process. So this is a brain. Myelin is the white um, area that you see here, and the gray matter is uh, all around it. Uh, these are the neurons uh, going down uh, in the white matter in the white matter area. 
So if you can compare, you can compare a neuron to an electric wire. Uh, in the neuron, you have a cell body, which is basically uh, this part of the wire. Uh, and then um, the axon is basically the wire itself. And it's protected by a myelin sheet, which is around it. Uh, it's very well, um, uh, um, it's been, uh, it's, it's around it and it's been compressed around it in order to uh, protect the axon, but also make sure that the electricity is conducted fast enough in the axon so that you can move your arms and legs. Um, uh, the cells in the brain that do the myelin are called oligodendrocytes. Uh, oligodendrocytes during development have are very, um, they have a lot of dem demand. They have to um, expand their processes in order to produce lots of myelin uh, that can be wrapped around different axons. If one oligodendrocyte dies or is not there because of uh, a lack in development or in the maturation of this oligodendrocyte, then uh, there will be several axons that won't be uh, myelinated properly. There's two main categories of leukodystrophies. That one of the first categories is hypomyelinating leukodystrophies, and these uh, are characterized by abnormal myelin deposition during development and a persistent lack of myelin in the brain. And all of the other disorders, including the demyelinating leukodystrophies, are under the uh, other category. So um, I'm not sure if you were there at my uh, uh, MRI 101 this morning, but this is a, uh, a normal brain MRI. So on T1, the white matter is white and the gray matter is gray, like you would see in an anatomy, in the anatomy of the brain, the, the brain previously uh, that I showed, showed you previously. In T2, it's the reverse. The white matter is a gray, uh, dark gray, and the gray matter is pale. Uh, and so if you look at uh, um, a disorder, like a demyelinating disorder or a disorder with another pathology than hypomyelination, on T1, the white matter is, uh, is dark versus white here, uh, so abnormal. And on T2, the white matter is also strikingly abnormal. You know, it's bright white compared to here. Uh, and then when you look at the hypomyelinating disorder, the white matter on T1 looks normal or almost normal. Okay, compared to this one, but the, the, the white matter on T2 is ab diffusely abnormal, but not as abnormal as you would see at the other pathology. So this is how, when we look at the, M the MRI, we decide which category of disease it is. It narrows down the possibilities of disorders. And so 4-H leukodystrophy is a hypomyelinating leukodystrophy. In order to be able to differentiate hypomyelination from delayed myelination or from normal myelination in a young child, uh, you need to understand uh, how myelination, pro um, myelination uh, progress during life. So myelination uh, starts in utero and progress something until adulthood, but at age two, uh, your myelination is almost completed. And we know exactly which structures myelinate at which age uh, in general, myelination starts from um, the bottom to up. It starts from the um, mid middle of the brain out, and then from the posterior region, so from the back to the front. So um, there's a lot of uh, myelinating leukodystrophies. Uh, initially, uh, Pelizer Smersbacher was, was described. Uh, and then uh, after that, they described Pelizer Smersbacher like disease. And then um, after that, basically anyone that was not either Pelizer Smersbacher disease or Pelizer Smersbacher like disease uh, had no molecular diagnosis. But over the years, there is a number of disorders that have been described and for which the genes have been discovered. I won't name them all, uh, but as you can see, uh, we dis discover uh, genes uh, regularly for these uh, for, for hypomyelinating leukodystrophies, and I think there's still some that we need to uncover. And so today we'll talk about polarity related or 4 H leukodystrophy. So um, before we start the talk, I wanted to acknowledge um, the fact that we um, collaborate with uh, researchers, clinicians, and families uh, all around the world, uh, and uh, and then we would not be able to do the work that we do without all, all of them. 
So a little bit of history about 4-H. In 2003, Atrini et al. Uh, described a disorder that they call the codystrophy with oligodontia. In 2005, uh, Dr. Wolf et al. described a disorder that they call ataxia with delayed dentition and hypomyelination. These kids were too young to be diagnosed with 4-H, which was described in 2006 by Timons et al. Uh, the 4-H patient, 4-H stands for hypomyelination, hypodontia, and hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And this long words, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, means uh, arrested puberty, delayed puberty, or absence of puberty. Um, in uh, 2009, there's a Japanese group who described a disorder that they call hypomyelination with cerebellar atrophy and hypoplasia of the corpus callosum. In 2010, uh, we described in a Quebec population um, a disorder that we called tremor, tremor ataxia with central hypomyelination. In 2011, we uh, identified the first two genes causing this disease. 2014, uh, we described uh, uh, the clinical features of, patient, of 105 patients. In 2015, we found the third gene causing this disease, and we started to understand the pathophysiology of the disease. In 2018, another group uh, uncovered a fourth gene for this disease. Um, so these are the publication of, uh, of the four different genes. Uh, so a little bit of background about 4-H, about, about poly, the RNA polymerase tree. So uh, the RNA polymerase tree is one of three uh, RNA polymerase. They're named one, two, three. And they're responsible for the transcription of DNA into RNA. So what I explained initially, DNA transcribed to RNA, translated to uh, protein. And they're responsible for a very specific set of non-coding small RNA that are very important for the, the cell uh, homeostasis, so to make sure that the cells remain healthy. Um, Polar 3A and Polar 3B, you can see them here. They're the biggest um, uh, subunit of these 17 subunit uh, polymerase. And this is their, our, the catalytic scent is at the center. So it's the active center. Uh, they form the active centers of the polymerase, meaning this is where the DNA goes in to be transcribed into RNA. And then Polar 1C, which is um, here. Uh, is, a, is another subunit of the polymerase, uh, which is it is a share with, with uh, the RNA polymerase 1. And then poly3K is here. So uh, what we've been able to demonstrate in the last few years, and I think we talked about that last year, so we won't go over this in detail, but we were able to demonstrate that some, um, uh, some mutation lead to uh, not enough of the subunit, so not enough polar 3A or not enough polar 3B. Um, some, sub some mutation lead to abnormal assembly of the polymerase, so overall not enough polymerase to do the transcription. And some other mutation we know lead to an abnormal interaction with the DNA and the actual polymerase, making, uh, making it difficult for the polymerase to do the transcription. But overall, all of these um, mutation leads to the polymerase not to be able to do enough uh, transcription. So our general hypothesis, which we're working really hard on proving, is that hypofunctional polar 3 complex, so not, uh, not functioning enough uh, polar 3, leads to an, an, abnorm an insufficient transcription during a critical developmental milestone, which is myelination. And I explained to you earlier that the, the oligodendrocytes have to produce, um, have to have, have to do a lot of transcription and translation during development because they have to expand their process uh, significantly, produce the myelin, and wrap around the, the nerve. So this is why we think uh, that um, it could be the reason why patients with mutation in these genes and other genes that are important for translation, for example, lead to uh, insufficient myelin deposition. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, about the clinical presentation that you, uh, for the, those who were there in the previous years, you're aware of the what we've published in 2014, which is the clinical spectrum of patients with polar 3A and polar 3B in 105 cases. But very recently, we've published another paper um, for the pre clinical presentation of patients with mutations in polar 1C. Uh, we do this work very closely uh, with the group in Amsterdam and especially with Nicole Wolf, which is uh, her pictures is here uh, too. 
So the typical presentation for 4-H, uh, most patients start in early childhood. Uh, we have late onset patients, it's the patient who present with late onset, even uh, in adulthood. Uh, the vast majority of patients are myopic, and the myopia usually progresses over years. So it's very important for these patients to be followed regularly by an ophthalmologist. Uh, there are endocrinological manifestations, and this is some of the th something that some of the things that we've studied in the last few years. We've reviewed 150 cases and realized that um, so we confirmed that the most common um, endocrinological abnormality was the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which leads to delayed puberty, arrested puberty, um, or a complete absence of puberty. Um, about 550% of patients have short stature. Uh, but uh, some of them have been tested for growth hormone deficiency and had growth hormone deficiency. Other did not. Uh, in the vast majority of patients that were sh that, that had that were that had short stature, um, they uh, they were not tested for growth hormone deficiency. So I think this is something that we need to look into in the coming years. And some patients also had hypothyroidism. So I think this emphasizes the importance of uh, having patients with 4-H uh, followed regularly by an endocrinologist. There are, so the neurological manifestation predominates. More children will present with motor uh, delay and or regression. And uh, usually we, we say the cerebellar features are more predominant, So we, which means patients are clumsy when they walk, uh, they, when they, they talk, it's slurred. Uh, they have some problem with uh, their fine motor movements. They, some, they can have tremor. Uh, they can also have pyramidal features, which is uh, some stiffness, usually mostly in the legs. Uh, they can also what we call, have, we call extra pyramidal features. Uh, and the most common one is dystonia which is abnormal postures of the feet and arm and legs. Most of the time, the dystonia and the pyramidal features are not much of a problem and don't need to be treated uh, with medication. And uh, some pa and most patients have some uh, cognitive impairment. Either they have learning delay or they have uh, uh, re cognitive regression. But this uh, really is not as prominent in most patients uh, compared to the motor features. In the older patients, though, uh, the patient that presents is, present lo later in life, usually the cognitive uh, impairment may be more uh, significant. Um, mo the majority of patients have dental abnormalities, which could be which are variable. So the common abnormality is the missing of these two teeth, the uh, mid middle inc incisors. Uh, sometimes they're missing. Sometimes they they grow uh, the in a, in, the, in a wrong orientation. Some children have smaller teeth or more space in between the teeth. We had a family where uh, the only abnormality was this tooth on both sides had a conical shape. And uh, for both, both kids had this, and one of the kids had also missing teeth. Um, so Mutation in polar one c I told you polar one c is a uh, is a uh, gene that's also mutated in uh, that is part of both polar one and polar three. It's also mutated in uh, Treacher Collins syndrome, which is a craniofacial um, uh, uh, craniofacial uh, disorder with craniofacial abnormality. Uh, and so we looked, and that was published just recently, uh, over uh, a series of patients with mutation in polar one c and we found that there was an overlap between the patients with the, the leukodystrophy, the 4 H leukodystrophy, and patients with treacher colon. We have only one patient that actually had both disorders. She she had typical features of um, treacher colon syndrome and uh, typical features of 4 H leukodystrophy. And I have permission to show you the, the, the photo of this child. Um, we had four uh, patients who had subtle evidence of craniofacial abnormal craniofacial development. Uh, they had some, um, their, um, their mandible, their lower face was mildly, uh, hypoplased, or was, was smaller than normal. Um, these patients had dental abnormality in 70% of case. 50% uh, of patients had um, a problem with their eyes. 50% uh, had problem uh, endocrine problems, but some of them were too small to to know whether or not they had hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. The typical MRI features um, 
of these patients is uh, thin corpus callosum. So this is the structure showed with an arrow. Um, atrophy of the cerebellum, which is a structure behind the brain, which is important for uh, balance uh, and, con and uh, coordination of movements, uh, which explains in part why the patients have uh, are unstable on their feet and they have trouble to reach for object and they have a tremor. And then there is diffuse hypomyelination. So if you remember from my previous slides, the white matter should be um, dark and it's actually white. And there's a very specific signature of the 4-H leukodystrophy with preservation. So some myelin, so this is the black or dark gray areas and specific structure, the dentic nucleus, the optic radiation, the uh, globus pallidus and the um, anterolateral nucleus of the thalamus. So we wanted to look at whether or not uh, having a mutation in one gene um, uh, was associated with a different type of clinical presentation. It's difficult to, uh, usually when we talk about genotype phenotype correlation, we look at uh, one specific mutation to see whether or not uh, it has a specific uh, associated uh, features. But since there's too many, there's so many mutations and most patients have two different mutations, it's very hard to have enough patients with two mutations to be able to conclude that um, there's a strong uh, genotype phenotype correlation with, with these. But we have a few, um, a few ideas. So in general, uh, polar 1C patients have the most severe presentation, followed by polar 3A and polar 3B. And this is measured by um, the, the progression of the disease and uh, uh, including the loss of ambulation and, and, and death. Um, polar 3B patients, however, present earlier than patients. Uh, polar 1C presents earlier and then polar 3B and then polar 3A. Patients that have a combination of this specific mutation, the 1771-7, uh, and a stop mutation have a very severe disease course and a specific MRI pattern. This page, this mutation, which is the common polar 3B mutation, most patients with polar 3B mutation has, have a copy of this. But if you are homozygous, if you have two copies of this mutation, most patient, patients are typically very are much milder and can be asymptomatic until uh, late in life. As I said before, polar one patient with polar one C uh, may have craniofacial abnormality that looks like future Collins syndrome. Uh, in travel, uh, so when you have two uh, affected an, an indiv individual in a family, it's usually uh, they usually are very similar in terms of presentation. But we do have rarely some families where uh, the presentation is very different. So one one patient with a typical uh, disease progression and one not or a more severe disease progression and another patient in the same family, which is very mild and, um, uh, and uh, stay, uh, stay ambulatory for a very long time. So I wanted to talk to you about this paper that was just published uh, by our group. Um, so uh, it was funded uh, by Fondation des Etoiles or Foundation of Stars and the Canadian Institute of Health Research. And uh, we did that in collaboration with the AIF Foundation for 4 h leukodystrophy. And Stéphanie Perrier and Laurence Gauquelin were the main students involved in this, uh, this work. So, uh, and I thank Steph for sharing her slide with me. Uh, so we had uh, three patients with a very mild uh, phenotype uh, and uh, that were diagnosed in adolescence uh, by a, an MRI that was done for another reason or adulthood too. Uh, and we have typical, when our courts, we have typical patients, but we also had five patients with a very severe phenotype with an onset of disease in one to th between one to three months of, of age. So um, the sixth infant that we uh, looked at, uh, at disease onset, as I said, very early on in life, they had developmental delay and regression. They were failure, they had failure to thrive and they regressed. They, they developed a microcephaly, which is a small head, a lot of difficulty swallowing and uh, respiratory insufficiency. 
they have a very typical MRI features, with, uh, which is different than what we typically see in 4-H. And they had a very specific combination of mutations. So on one allele, on one copy of their, of their gene, they had a stop. So this is a the the, the transcript the transcription happens and then suddenly it says to stop. So it leads to a smaller uh, RNA which is destroyed. So no protein is produced basically. And they had this specific splice site mutation. When I said the intron exon boundaries were important, this is a mutation that is located in the intron and exon boundaries, and it's important for splicing. So for the process of putting the DNA into RNA. So we first look at the impact, uh, we should first look at the brain of these patients. Um, and so as you can see, this is a typical patient with the hypomyelination and these, this is a patient with a severe phenotype. Uh, if you see compared to this patient, which is a typical one, there is more myelin than in the typical patient. However, there are specific structures that are abnormal in this patient that are not abnormal in uh, the typical the patients with a typical feature. For these region here, the basal ganglia, are abnormal. If you look at it, they're almost white versus here where they're almost black. Okay, and I won't go through all of the abnormalities, but there, uh, what 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 is important to remember is that uh, there's more myelin than the typical patient, and there is abnorm abnormality in some some specific structures which are not the same as patient with the, the typical phenotype. Um, and then we looked at the pathology of one of our patients who unfortunately passed away. Uh, and what we were able to see is uh, first, there was not enough myelin uh, in the brain. Uh, there was loss of myelin and the myelin that we uh, that was produced was abnormal. So there was poor myelination. And this was also seen in the cerebellum. Finally, we did some molecular work and that's why my genetic one who won a few slides were, were important. So what we uh, hypothesis in the beginning is that uh, we know that if you have no polar tree whatsoever, uh, it's incompatible with life. And we know that from studies in mice, uh, where, uh, with, where, we, where a researcher tried to do a mouse with two um, stop, uh, so two mutations that leads to no protein, and these mice are not viable. So then we knew that this leaky, this variant, this plicide variant was not leading to an absent protein entirely, and it was probably leaky. So sometimes, splicing the right way, sometimes not splicing the right way. So we did lots of work to try to demonstrate that. So this patient has a, a variant here, which is a stop. The star means a stop. So this, when, when this variant is, with this copy is transcribed, it's being destroyed and there's no protein produce, produced. So we really wanted to know what this variant was doing. Okay, and so we did the sequence, the, the, the RNA of this patient, and we found, uh, so this is a normal person, so you see there's a lot of pr product here, but this patient has three lines. And so when we looked at the first line, okay, um, we saw a normal, so the, the, the variant is between exon 14 and 15, so we saw a normal variant, a normal uh, sequence. So this, so this time, for this one, um, the uh, the machinery was able to uh, splice the right way, and then the second time, uh, the second band, band here, when we sequence it, there's missed the exon fourteen is missing, uh, so there's a mistake in the splicing caused by the minus seven variant, and when we sequence this one, both exon thirteen and fourteen were missing. Uh, and um, and again, there was a problem with the way uh, the splicing happened. We did more work, which is a little, but it's uh, hard to explain. But we did more work uh, where we looked at whether what happened with these um, with these two um, mRNA, and we we were able to prove that they are destroyed, and that's good because we know that sometimes if you have proteins that are too short uh, or not as well formed, that it could be um, toxic for the cells. And that's why they're getting destroyed by a specific mechanism. So in summary, this patient has a stop here and this splice site variant here in the entron exon boundary. And then when there's when they when it's when it gets spliced, you get 
a normal a normal uh, copy. You get uh, a copy with the um, the stop. Uh, we get you, which is going to end up with no protein, and then you get a copy that's missing exon 14 and a copy that's missing exon 13 and 14. So this copy is getting destroyed. This copy is getting destroyed. This copy is getting destroyed. So the patient are are are, are rem remain only with this, which is not enough protein to uh, do the work. So then we wanted to know whether or not uh, there was more, that was, there was less polar 3 in the brain of our patient. Uh, so we did uh, do uh, Western blood. Western blood is a, is a way to look at proteins in the, in, the, in the cells. So what we were able to see, to do, so we do a, a control protein and we did polar 3 a and we compare the two. Um, and so if you look at the control, there is more polar 3 a in the white matter. Um, compared to the severe patients. And the same is true for uh, the, what, the gray matter. But if you, and then we quantify this with statistic, but, and then if you look, um, there is more reduction of the, the, um, the, uh, the white matter in the, in the cortex and the gray matter compared to the white matter, which goes a little bit with, the, with what we see in patients. Uh, um, and they, they seem to have more neuronal involvement versus the typical patient, which seems to have more oligodendrocyte involvement. Around the same period, there were three other papers that were published by other group um, in, uh, in this, these two variants. So I would minus, minus seven and a, a minus six one of which was published by the group of Nicole Wolf. Um, and so if we, if we re summarize what these papers uh, had shown, uh, is if you have two copies of the minus six, or you have a copy of the minus six, six plus a copy of the minus, minus seven, you have a specific MRI pattern with basal ganglia involvement. So basal ganglia are these structures in the middle of the brain. They're involved in, in, move, in controlling movements. Uh, so these patients typically have uh, dystonia, they present later, and they have dystonia um, and gait abnormalities. Uh, but these patients do not have any white matter involvement. If you have, if we call that compound heterozygous, so if you have a mutation, uh, the, you have the minus six or the minus seven or the minus six plus another variant, you still have the basal ganglia abnormalities. Uh, you will have, though, mild hypomyelination. As I, as I said before, there's more myelin than in, in a typical patient, but there's less myelin than it should be. And the severity of the presentation will depend on what you have on your second copy of the gene. If you have a stop, uh, so a mutation that leads to no protein, you will have a more severe phenotype. If you have a missense variant on the other copy, you will have a milder phenotype, which will look like uh, a little bit more similar to the patients that are homozygous for this. So what we think, and we don't know why, but we think that these two splice variants are very specific to the cells in the basal ganglia, uh, and they are, uh, they are probably have a specific effect on the neuron in these, um, in these areas. So uh, first, I want to thank the patients and their families. Uh, we couldn't do that uh, without them. I'd like to thank all of our collaborators, which don't fit in one slide. I'd like to thank my team. Uh, I really am ex extremely lucky. I have an amazing uh, team um, uh, of employees and students. Uh, so Luan Tran, who is here almost at the beginning of the lab, <clears throat> Sarah, Leigh, and Lama, who are uh, joined the lab in the last year or two. Um, and then uh, Bernard Bré and Roberta Lapiana, who are working in Montreal on the adult onset leukodystrophies. Benoit Coulomb, who works on the proteins, uh, proteomics of, the work of what we do uh, with us. Um, Claudia Kleinman, who does uh, all the RNA-seq uh, with us on our patient, and Dr. Fale Bianco, who is essential to this project. Uh, she did the neuropathology uh, work uh, at St. Justin, which is the, another hospital in Montreal. And then the international collaborators, which we you know most, uh, 
probably Adam van der Veer, Nicole Wolf, uh, with whom most of these study could not have been done. Uh, she's been a collaborator and has become a friend over the years, and I'm very privileged to be able to work with her. Mario van der Knapp, who is also in Amsterdam, for which um, I am also very grateful for everything she teached me and for our collaborations. Uh, Raphael Schiffman, um, who uh, was uh, part of the pioneers in describing this uh, disorder, as well as Nicole. Uh, Isabel Tifo, who works in Kansas City, and she does all our next-gen sequencing. Paul Tisar, in which we've started collaboration to do our, our organoids and patient in, with, uh, in 4-H leukodystrophy. Stephanie Perrier, uh, who is a PhD student in my lab, she works on uh, IPSC in patients with 4-H. Um, 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 Mac uh, Robinson, Michel Robinson, who works on the mouse model of 4-H, and then uh, my three master, they're both um, PhD and MD PhD, my three master students, um, Alexa Dirksen, who works on a new gene, um, Aaron um, Spa, who works on the natural history study of 4-H leukodystrophy, uh, Alexandra Chaplot, who works on um, EPRS-related leukodystrophy, which is another um, uh, hypomyelin leukodystrophy, and then uh, three uh, uh, resident in uh, Pease Neuro, uh, Laurence Gauquin, who did the, worked a lot on the Polar 1C paper, on the spectrum paper that we uh, just presented, Galia uh, Aliazidi, who worked on dystonia and 4 H leukodystrophy, and uh, Felix Pelti, who worked together with um, Stephanie to uh, do the uh, endocrine paper that we submitted and hopefully will be accepted soon. And over the years, these are the funding that we've received for this project. Thank you very much. And now I'll take questions. No questions. No questions. Um, comments, perhaps? Okay, but we have another uh, 25 minutes for, for discussion and question. So I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. I'm also happy to receive comments. If some of you just want to say hello, uh, because I don't know who's there and who's not there, but um, usually at the conference we can uh, we can at least uh, see each other and talk to each other. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to. So everything is in the live comments. I don't know if I'm allowed to read them. Oh, I think I am. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so we are very, so I'm going to read them. Uh, so we are very grateful for all your work in the past at this meeting. You have shared what you would like to see from the patient community to help advance therapeutic efforts. Um, I think what was really nice in the last uh, two years, I think, uh, but more actively for the last year, I think, uh, 4-H leukodystrophy uh, has found a, a home 
uh, with the Yaya Foundation for 4 H leukodystrophy, and that's I think uh, excellent for the patients. I think it's going to be uh, also very uh, also excellent for the for the researcher because it's going to facilitate our collaboration and uh, the fundraising that you're going to do to to um, to help our research will help us uh, work faster. Um, and so I think that's. Uh, I think that's um, I think that that will be very helpful uh, in terms of what uh, patients can do individually. Uh, we are really working hard on a natural history study uh, and we uh, now have uh, a very uh, detailed database uh, that we enter data into and that uh, you are invited to enter data into that we would really, uh, so if you would want to participate as a 4-H patient or parents of a 4-H, a patient with 4-H, that you please reach out to us, to me, or um, and I'll put you into, in touch with my research team and we'll organize the the, um, uh, the recruitment. And uh, and then without natural history study, uh, it's going to be very hard to design a clinical trial. So we're working on both hands. We're working on uh, trying to develop treatments. Uh, the big challenge that we've had over the years is having a good model. Typically, a good model is a mouse model, uh, but it's been really challenging, and I, and I presented that last year. Um, I hope I'll be able to present something encouraging next, next year. Um, and uh, the other model that uh, that is very promising is uh, the uh, pluri induced pluripotent stem cells, so we can take skin cells or blood cells from patients and transform them into brain cells and then study them and try to uh, treat them with some uh, for different uh, for, with different uh, uh, medication or uh, different strategies. So it's something else we um, we've, we've been working on. Um, okay. And then uh, can you see progression of balance difficulty, but not see any progression of the white matter in the cerebellum. Yes, yes, we can. Uh, so we have patients that do not have, um, so patients have, uh, so that patients with typical 4-H uh, have um, normal white matter in their cerebellum or, and their cerebellum may be smaller or may become smaller with time. Uh, but it's not just the cerebellum itself probably that lead to ataxia and the balance problem, but also the connection from the cerebellum to the motor areas. So there is the cerebellum itself, but it's not just it. It has to, co to connect with other uh, areas of the brain. So if you have a lesion or something that somewhere where it doesn't work well, that is in this pathway, you can have problem uh, with your gait. And so um, I think that the fact that the cerebellum is hypomyelinated, hypomyelinated initially leads to um, uh, leads to uh, motor, motor problems, but these motor problems probably uh, get worse as the cerebellum becomes smaller. Uh, but there also may be something that we, there's probably also something that we can't measure on the MRI. Um, what can we be doing to help move your effort to find therapies and cure forward? Um, uh, I, I think. Uh, the simple answer is uh, uh, money. The more money we we have, the faster we can go, uh, because the more risks we can take. Um, I think that's the the easiest, uh, the simplest answer. Uh, my grandson was born, and he came out with tremors. He had an MRI when he was in six days, six, when he was six days old. They said it showed nothing abnormal. He has problems since the day he was born. He had genetic. I don't have the the, the end of it, so um, so I don't have the the rest of the of the comment from Paula. Uh, I think that. Um, 
patient with uh, 4-H in general are born normal. The patients that have this more severe form of the disease can be uh, um, Okay, he has he was diagnosed with polar three A. What is the life expectancy when you have shown stilted birth? So it's that's very that's a very difficult question. Uh, you can have tremor at birth for different reason. Um, so it, it you can't I can't comment on on this without uh, having more information. Um, and even with uh, the mutations and how he's doing now. It's very hard to predict, and I never give uh, uh, um, I never give a time because every child is different, and uh, sometimes you know we think it's going to go well, and unfortunately it doesn't go as well as we would like to, and other times uh, we we think it's going to go uh, unwell, and it goes unwell, or we think it's going to go unwell, and it goes well. So it's very very hard to make any comment about this. Uh, but if um, if you are if uh, if we you're, you haven't reached out to us, I invite you to reach out to us, and we could uh, uh, we could arrange uh, a little bit more talk, and we can involve your doctors, uh, your doctors as well, and try to see how we could um, help organize the supportive care for your for your son. Uh, for your grandson, sorry. So I guess if it's yeah, if it's your grandson, then your you, the parents have to reach out uh, because we need the parents' uh, authorization to discuss his case, and they have to be present. And then I have uh, did I understand correctly that the primary predictors of disease course is the level of hypomyelination? No, no, I, I, no. So it's the the no, uh, sorry. So okay. So we know that the typical patients have almost no myelin. Uh, we know that the very mild patient uh, have more myelin, but the very severe patients that we've said that I've talked to you about have more myelin than the than the typical patients. So it, it's not it's not as simple as that, uh, and we don't know why, but we're looking into it. Uh, absent change in myelination between MRIs over time, does level of myelination at certain age or time predict future regression disease course? No, there's not a good correlation between uh, the amount of myelin and how the patient uh, will uh, progress over time, except I would say for the very mild patient with the armosagus for R3B, but even then, um, like a few weeks ago, or a week or two ago, there was a patient with this specific combination of mutation who was having a uh, disease course more like more like the typical patients. So really, um, it's easier uh, it's easier for clinicians who are used to see patients with this disease to give a better idea to the parents about what they've seen in patients that look like there's their, their child, but even then, it's not uh, it's not that easy. Hi, Geneviève. Hi. Uh, nice to see you virtually. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Uh, I'm very grateful for for you listening. I hope you understand some of it because I know uh, English is not your first uh, language. And I hope to see you in Montreal soon. Are there any other comments or questions? I wish I could see you all. I think we have another 12 minutes. You can also chat between each between on each other uh, if you'd like. So Ron Garber said, we wish uh, we could see you and each other too. Thank you for everything you are doing. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I wish I could see you and hug you all. And I'd like to see your kids too.
Do you want to end the session earlier? Um, let's uh, perhaps uh, just chat uh, yes or no. If we're doing virtual appointment for those of us who cannot travel to Montreal. So what we do, um, so we have different um, different way of working. Uh, we cannot do a formal clinical uh, visit uh, if you don't travel to Montreal. We could discuss with your uh, with your physicians and with you about our experience in general with 4-H. Uh, we can't do specific recommendation for your child uh, if you're not traveling to Montreal. For our natural history study, you don't have to travel to Montreal, so you can um, we, we can do most things remotely. Uh, and uh, if you are able to travel to Montreal, we usually would see you every year uh, or whenever you can come. But you, it's not uh, for the research; it's not uh, obligatory. And for the clinical part, as I said, I'm always happy to speak to you, to the clinicians following your child, um, to uh, to give our experience with 4-H in general. I'm not sure which screen you're seeing. Are you seeing my kids fighting on the picture? How, how long is the waiting list to see international patients in Montreal? Um, uh, now the difficulty is COVID-19 for traveling. Uh, the borders are, uh, are closed, but since um, uh, okay, I have thank you, Ron. So I guess on my other screen, I have pictures of my screen three kids fighting. It's a very funny picture, and then I and then I thought the because that was the screen I was sharing initially, so I thought you were seeing that, and I just felt a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so um, yeah, so there's this, so since uh, since most patients within that come internationally are coming for. For the research as well uh it's not the same as uh, you're not on my clinical waiting list uh we book a research visit so we arrange you for you to come to montreal for like two days depending on how long you how long you can stay and then we and amongst these two days you will see me uh and we'll we'll have a discussion and talk about your child i'll examine him etc cetera, etc cetera. um and then you, you'll have an, uh, you'll see an OT, uh, uh, and then you'll have several, you'll fill a lot of questionnaires for us. And then if you want to, uh, and then, so it's not like there's a, it's not like there's a waiting list. Usually if you come for the research and you want the clinical opinion as well, we will arrange it at the same time as the research visit. And it's gonna be outside my clinic, outside of my regular clinics. Um, I know there are the ones that will have to set it up. We live in Indiana, very hard to find doctors around us that even knows about what it is. Yeah, so I know that it's it's hard to the conditions. A lot of clinicians don't know uh, the disease, and um, and uh, but that's why uh, that that's why we're here. Uh, that's how that's how they, they just they can reach out to us and uh, and we'll try to help them the best we can. Uh, uh, and then uh, how long is the waiting list? Okay, thank you from Julia Novak. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, thank you for all you and the research team are doing. We met you in Washington, D.C. back in 2011, I believe, when the first 4-H conference was conducted. Yes, I remember you very well. 
I remember you very well. I hope we can see each other uh, again. My 13-year-old daughter is doing well and continues visit with Dr. Van Der Ver. We are involved and supportive in any continuing research and funding we contribute to. Thank you so much, um, Dina. It's very nice of you. Uh, we are collaborating with Dr. Van Der Ver, so the patients that are traveling to CHOP are also part of the natural history study. It's not yet uh, um, fully organized, but in the coming uh, few months, we'll be able to uh, to uh, work towards this. We've asked for funding from the NIH. I hope we will get some money to do this because it's important to do. Uh, we will do some of it uh, without funding, but of course, we won't be able to do as much as we would be able to with uh, with significant with funding. I hope I didn't miss any uh, any questions. So one question is, how often does a swallow study need to be repeated? So it depends. Uh, it varies uh, from one child to the other. In general, I do it every six months. Um, but you know, if the, in the kids that are um, having more problems, I do them more often. Uh, in kids that are really are very, very stable, sometimes I will uh, space them out a little bit more. Um, and so there, there's so the reason why I do them frequently is that before the child stuff starts coughing on their and drink like regularly when he drinks and eats, um, they have already have dysphagia for a while and they have uh, had aspiration that are um, we call that silent aspiration, and so this is to detect th those that I do um, regular video fluoroscopy uh, or. Um, I'm trying to find the term you use in the uh, barbarium swallow, I think you call them in the US. Um, basically to look at whether or not all the what, what drinks and eat goes into the stomach and not in the lungs. But typically before we have real symptoms of, of, uh, of uh, dysphagia or worsening dysphagia, there is some silent aspiration, which are very easily to treat with a change in the diet. Typically, it starts first with the thin liquid, and then just uh, thickening the liquid a little bit makes a huge difference in preventing aspiration. And we want to prevent aspiration for two main reasons, because we want uh, to avoid um, aspiration pneumonia, which is unfortunately uh, um, uh, can be very dangerous for our kids. Um, and then the other thing is because if you aspirate chronic, chronically, so regularly over months to years, you develop a lung disease. Um, and then you, you don't want that uh, because it's, uh, it just adds another level of difficulties for your kids. So we, we do that uh, repetitively and we change the way we feed, we feed the child accordingly. Any more questions? The, the, last, the last thing I wanted to, to say before uh, we finish is um, is for the dysphagia. The kids uh, with uh, 4-H are very unpredictable in terms of dysphagia. So you always have to be more cautious because sometimes they're good to swallow and other times they have more problems. So uh, we recommend to be very, very careful about uh, how you feed your kids. So we have a minute and 30 seconds left. I will soon have the instructions to tell you that we are almost done. Yeah, I think I have to. It was really nice to have you uh, on here. Thank you for your attention. I hope you're enjoying the ULF meeting and I hope to see all of you next year in Chicago, um, and uh, one more, one more minute, or one more question.
Uh, is it possible for an MRI to show hypomyelination and dysmyelination? Um, so it depends. Uh, I, I try to stay away from dysmyelination um, because it it doesn't give much. Uh, like is it myelin? So if you divide them simply into two things, hypomyelination meaning not enough myelin, other categories meaning the myelin is sick it's just easier than this myelination is it because there's not enough myelin or is it because the myelin is sick or but it's been it's used by radiologists but i prefer to i prefer to avoid this term um so i think some people may use this myelination uh for some cases of some radiologists would would read this myelination in a patient with hypomyelination Time's up. So um, it was really nice to have you all here. Um, and I wish to see you next year in Chicago, as I said earlier, without COVID-19 and with the AUG. And, uh, and take care. OK? Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Bye.